लबैक या हबीब मन लबैक सैयदी लबैक या इमामना लबैक मुर्शदी लबैक मुर्शदी लबैक मुर्शदी Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Khilafat Day 2022 series. In today's episode, we'll be learning about how the blessed guidance of Hazrat Khalifatul Masih Ayatollah Taala bin Abdul Aziz has enabled IEEE and Humanity First to serve mankind in the best way possible. To discuss this, we have with us in the studio today Dr. Aziz Afif Saab, who is serving as Chairman of Humanity First UK, and alongside him we have Akram Ahmed Saab, who is serving as Chairman of IEEE for Europe. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to you both. Wa alaikum assalam wa Thank you. If we could kick off today's discussion just talking about how Hazrul's vision has guided both of your respective uh, departments. I could start if we could begin with IEEE first. Yes, you know uh, uh, IEEE existed for many years. It started with uh, with through the Khilafat of Khalifa Salis and when we were just doing uh, you know little works in jalsas and preparing organizing jalsas for for the jamaat but when hazur anwar uh, you know was elected to his exalted position he di- changed our direction and wanted us to work in humanitarian ways and see how we could serve humanity and with that regard in particular he, because you know he himself had stayed many years in ghana where he suffered uh, himself because of lack of water portable water he wanted us to get water to the remotest parts of africa and so he has very cleverly i would say you know uh, guided us how to get to those places and how to get water and bring water to these poor people who 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 have nothing else otherwise so this was the main crux of the way he changed our direction of our work in humanitarian work and then on top of that he said I want you to bring electricity for two reasons essentially so that the people in the remotest part have electricity and light and so they can work at night and also to bring MTA because through MTA he knew that people will then change their habits and that's what we did these were the two sort of uh, spearheads which he guided us to follow I perhaps uh, Uh, as you if you could narrate how these um, two guided uh, you want to indeed. first so exactly for the opportunity if i can share with you azuz vision for humanity first in his in his own words and if i can just quote recently at the humanity first conference he stated and this summarizes his vision for what he expects of us always the primary focus and desire of every member of humanity first should be to serve the interests of the weakest members of society rather than to serve their own self interest in any way whatsoever so that is a is a small quote but it it has massive meaning in terms of how a humanitarian organization should work and how we as humanity first should work and encompasses so many areas of trying to dampen one's ego making sure that you're working across society across backgrounds across cultures uh so i think those words speaks for themselves in terms of vision i think he ingrained in us uh that we must sacrifice you know we weren't going there just to enjoy ourselves you know so many ngos do that anyway bring water and what have you you know but when we started working you know i would ask our engineers if you can afford to pay for the airfare that would be great and even when they go in country you know they would be supported by our missions locally and i told our guys you've got to start eating local food you know <laughs> that's part of the sacrifice in fact you know and in fact when they begin to enjoy it uh, they eat it they really begin to enjoy it as well so that was also another part of our sacrifice was to pay for ourselves and then that way uh, you know we we sh- saw the passion Uh, of 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 our work and alhamdulillah you know when we first went to give you a good example 
is that one village we went where we brought in water and electricity, that when I first went there, there were only two bicycles at the time, you know, in the village. And I went there four or five years afterwards, after we had brought them water and electricity. And when I went there, it, I was just amazed because now they had two cars <laughs> and, you know, about 20 motorcycles and maybe even 100 cycles, you know. And that was because what they did was they started growing crops and then start selling them and then they start making money out of it. So a real life changer for them and the whole scene changed for them really in a way. And that is what our ultimate aim was to make a complete change in their lives. And Alhamdulillah, wherever we've gone and built these villages and brought water and electricity, we see this change in the people. And so it has been very, for personally also, you know, it, it's been so welcoming that this is the sort of thing which many of us want to do in our lives, you know. Uh, uh, Humanity First volunteers and ourselves and many other NGOs as well. And we have the, got this great opportunity, you know, and this is through the vision of Hazrat Amir Mamini. Following on from that, so uh, many people may have the perception or misperception that a lot that Humanity First and IEEE focuses in Africa, but obviously there's other areas that you support as well. Could you narrate some of those, uh, describe some of those projects that are on so ongoing at the moment? You're absolutely right. So Humanity First, within the UK, we're covering food banks, befriending service, support line, community gardens, uh, in the occupied territories in Palestine, water desalination, gardens, IT labs for the blind in South America, state-of-the-art hospitals, in, on the Ukrainian border with Poland, providing medical support and essential services uh, for the refugees. In Southeast Asia, again, water provision, education, disaster response. Back in the United Kingdom, thought leadership, bringing uh, key academics in the humanitarian sector to share their knowledge on the sector to the public. So across the world, outside Africa, these are some of the examples of where we try to assist. This is the whole thing about uh, guidance from Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen and, and the blessing of Ahmadiyyat, that we are not uh, just engaged in one small area of the world, but it is all across Africa, uh, all, all across the world. For IEEE, similarly, you know, we have associations in Australia, in Indo Indonesia, in India, Pakistan, and Alhamdulillah, through IA Europe, we have extended it into Africa. You know, we have now made them stand on their own feet. So we've got uh, registered uh, IAAA in Nigeria, in Ghana, and now we are doing in uh, Ivory Coast. So, so, you know, our intention had always been to make them self-sufficient. They stand up on their feet, and that is the best help you can ever give to any country, you know. And this is where our work is so different from other NGOs, from even government work. I was discussing just yesterday in a meeting with some, uh, 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 what is it, uh, uh, Baha'is, you know, and they were asking how we have operated, you know, and I ex explained to them that the way we have operated is that we have actually made sure that the local people are, are self-sufficient. That is the only way our things will work. Otherwise, the African countries and other developing countries will always remain subservient to the West because they will have to, you know, they, they, they are made to understand that you can only get help from us. But what we are doing is making them stand up on their own feet. You know, for example, in Mali, we've got our teams working with Humanity First that uh, they actually do all the work. We just provide a little bit of money. And that is what we want to do. And now this time is coming when they will also start providing the f uh, money themselves. So that is our ultimate aim. They stand on their feet and then, but we continue to support as much as we can. I mean, it's a blessing for us that we can do that, you know. It's so, 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 uh, uh, so good for us, you know and we hope we'll be able to do that. But ultimately, they will stand up on their feet and uh, we will be giving a support role to them.
Inshallah. That's very inspiring to hear as well. That's right. Uh, now, both of you have also been very fortunate to have had uh, direct guidance from beloved Hazur as well. Um, are there any inspiring stories or inspiring guidance that beloved Hazur has given to you? Uh, Akram Sabi, you start. Yeah, you know, I, uh, we just uh, finished uh, about two, three months ago <coughs> uh, a model village in Benin. And when we finished that village, and as uh, you know, we went for an opening ceremony with them, and as I was leaving, the chief, uh, one of the other guys said, the chief wants to say a few words to you. So I said, yes, all right. So the chief came to me and he said, you know what? When he joined Ahmadiyat a few years back, and th this is the amazing thing, that in West Africa, Ahmadiyat wasn't there even 10, 20 years ago. You know, it has just started recently. But yet the people are so righteous that one of them, and the chief said that when we first came, and we brought them water and all that. He said, you know, my greatest desire was to see the Khalifa. That is what I really wanted to see. To see the Khalifa was for me like seeing the Holy Prophet So he said, I wanted to tell you something, that when you brought MTA here and I saw life, the Khalifa of the time giving a Friday sermon, my dream had been fulfilled. What I had wished for, to see the Holy Prophet وسلم, I was seeing in the Khalifa of the age. And that's why, you know, he said, I have specially called you for that. I want you to take this message for me to Hazur, and which I gave to Hazur as well, that this is how these people have love and affection for Islam and for the Holy Prophet وسلم, through the works that we do. Is there any incidents that Beloved Hazur has given to you directly and any guidance that he's given? Again, uh, there are practical steps whenever uh, our teams are out on deployment and probably one of the most key is the, the prayers and the ultimate uh, principle. And he mentioned in great detail the philosophy of, of Astaghfar. Uh, and for us it's like a blind spot insurance policy, I would call it, that, that you pray that God protects you from the hiccups that you cannot see. And we've seen that on the ground in, in, in Iraq most recently, uh, where we, only by God's grace, following Zur's guidance, were able to be protected from some, some major potential tragedies. And at the same time, Azur's ethos of maximum utility with minimal resource, uh, which is said time and time again. And only by God's grace, uh, we were trying to provide for some refugees, IDPs, following the war in, in Iraq, um, and the insurgency, the projects that were costing thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, only by God's grace we were able to provide the same project at 10% of the cost. Providing for displaced children, we were able to provide uh, the same, if not more, capacity of provisions for those children at less than 10% uh, of the cost. Uh, and this we would not have even imagined uh, because there was no way those costs could have been reduced that we thought but but yet through through prayers and through following that guidance of, of turning to the Almighty for help when no other door and avenue seems to be opening and, and the results speak for themselves and then the countless countless uh, uh, incidences throughout Africa and other disaster zones where our our doctors and our disaster responders have seen firsthand, firsthand uh, miracles uh, by the hour and by the day that despite their professional knowledge, despite their professional skill, despite them being at the top of the game in their professional fields, these things were impossible, yet they were seen to be possible. So these incidents have not only strengthened their faith in the living existence of a creator, uh, it's also uh, pushed them to continue serving further. It's obviously clear, but the, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the guidance of Hazrat Khalifa Masih, that your respective organizations have made vast progress in, obviously, in a relatively short period compared to obviously other organizations. Um, is there any other future plans that you could let our viewers yeah, know about? And ultimately, I think especially anything they can get involved in as well? Yes, especially, you know, because uh, if... Uh, in the last symposium that we had with Hazur Anwar, uh, 
uh, which was only two months ago, he has uh, directed us to look at how to deal with nuclear war and how we would try to bring up communities from scratch because that is the reality of nuclear war. Everything can be destroyed. And so this is one direction and we are working with Humanity First as well, how we are going to bring these issues together and how we are going to set up, uh, as Hazur said in his uh, uh, instructions to us, you know, that imagine you are going to s start from scratch. And that is the reality and this is something which even today the Western world and the rest of the world is not recognizing that what is happening now in Ukraine and Russia, it has got a very devastating effect. It can, it can have very devastating effect, you know. And so we are getting prepared for that, how we would deal in that situation. And Alhamdulillah, our engineers and architects are working on different types of scenarios or what type of structures we need. I mean, also not only structures, but also water. You know, water will also get contaminated. Even water wells will get contaminated. So we are looking at all those aspects of how to safeguard our water supplies. And we are doing it, looking at it also in, in here, in, in England, in Europe as well, of how we are going to secure our own at least uh, sources. And then we will start looking at the rest of the world. This is a tremendous work uh, in which we need to work. And all our organizations, you know, within Islam, within Ahmadiyya, there is the Khudam, the youth, the Ansar, the older people, Humanity First and other uh, 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 other uh, auxiliary organizations within the Jamaat, we are actually working, we have to work together because we can't work on our own, it's just too much. It is huge, the amount of work we will need to think of. And that is what His Holiness is preparing us for. And this is the, you know, sort of the farsightedness which only can come through Khilafat that it can guide us to look into such areas where we had never thought we would be looking into. And that is what our work is as engineers and architects. And as I said, Humanity First has been very good in bringing resources and you know things uh, in disaster zones. So they have got that experience and inshallah, together we will be working together to make sure that we can then uh, try to save the world as much as we can. I think it's obviously going to be very vital, important work, and it's going to require the effort of everyone really to get involved. Absolutely, that's um, right. Is there anything you can Indeed, highlight in the highlight first? And I would second that. Following Hazur Akhtas' uh, sort of uh, historic address at the IEEE conference, uh, I mean, the key message that, that we took home, uh, as Akram Sahib has stated, is making Africa self sustainable, making it uh, completely sustainable, that it stands on its own feet and it's actually providing for others. And for that, you need strong, deep infrastructure across all levels. And as Akram Sahib says, that working where there is nothing. And I think it's a huge opportunity, looking at capacity building, looking at training, looking at manufacturing, a whole host of areas which uh, the continent of Africa is prime and ready to move forward. Desakala to both of you, that was very enlightening and very inspiring as well. And I hope our viewers at home benefited from that discussion as well. Uh, until next time we meet, Assalamu Alaikum.